Hello and welcome to Skynet Today's Let's Talk AI podcast, where you can hear from AI researchers about what's actually going on with AI and what is just clickbait headlines. I am Andrei Kornikov, a third year PhD student at the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. I focus mostly on learning algorithms for robotic manipulation in my research. And with me is my co-host. I'm Sharon, a third year PhD student in the machine learning group working with Andrew Ng. I do research on generative models, improving generalization of neural networks, and applying machine learning to tackling the climate crisis. Hope you're doing well, Sharon. This is our 10th episode of this podcast, uh, at least in the news discussion format. So (laughs) we've been doing it for a little bit now. And uh, yeah, I wonder, uh, has discussing the news and kind of checking in on what's going on with AI out there and not just in research uh, changed your outlook or made you think about it more? It definitely made me think about it more and also think about the impact of what my research and just generally what our research in the lab, um, how it affects people uh, and how it's also perceived. Yeah, I agree. I think as AI researchers, actually, we don't have that much incentive or push to actually pay attention to what's happening with AI out there in the real world outside academia. But it is kind of cool to be more aware of it and keep up with it. And it does make me reflect more on my research and how it relates to these trends. It's exactly what the NeurIPS guidelines wants us to feel. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the whole field is moving in that direction, uh, which I think is presumably for the best. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, we have a mental enough. advances on data sets and so on. And it's good to think more about how this stuff will affect the real world. It's also interesting that the fact that there are news articles, perhaps like pop science articles uh, about our work, uh, then it gets us to think about it a little bit more because we hear people who are not deep in the weeds reflecting on it. And I imagine that some fields don't have this luxury where they don't have other people reflecting on um, essentially their work. uh, And so they don't get that for free in a sense. They would have to spend time outside to really reflect on it. Here, I think we get this luxury of having these news articles already reflect on a lot of our work. Um, and it just makes it easier to, to get our, get our minds thinking about it a little bit more. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a luxury and a bit of a curse, maybe how AI is, you know, uh, a thing that a lot of people find interesting and cool. And so there is a lot of media hype and attention around it. Often AI researchers, I think, get annoyed at how the media represents the state of AI, right? Because it doesn't quite match how we perceive it. Um, But there are also the positive aspects, as you say. But uh, enough discussion of the podcast and ourselves. Let's get on with talking about this week's news. Uh, Starting with this article from VentureBeat titled... OpenAI begins publicly tracking model efficiency. So this is a news article covering some new research from the semi-for-profit company OpenAI, which uh, announced on May 5th that it has begun tracking machine learning models that achieve state-of-the-art efficiency, an effort it believes will help identify candidates for scaling and achieve top overall performance. So what this is about is basically how much energy, how much computation do you need to spend to get a performant AI model. And the findings about OpenAI were that over the last decade, over kind of a while, um, the amount of computation needed to achieve great or like state of our performance has been decreasing pretty consistently across multiple areas. In fact, uh, OpenAI claims that spotlighting these models will also, quote, paint a quantitative picture of algorithmic success, which in turn will inform policymaking by renewing the focus on AI's technical attributes and societal impact. And I think that definitely is true. And as we we can dive a bit into some of the specifics that they found in their survey, for example, they found that Google's transformer architecture 
uh, surpassed a previous state-of-the-art model called seek to seek which was also developed by Google, with 61 times less compute. They also found that DeepMind's AlphaZero, a system that taught itself from scratch how to master the games of chess, shogi, and go, took eight times less compute to match an improved version of the system's predecessor, AlphaGo Zero, just one year later. And overall, uh, they also speculate that algorithmic efficiency might outpace gains from Moore's law, the observation that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit doubles every two years, and which has explained uh, and pushed a lot of success in AI and software at large. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you that this sort of tracking could actually do what they say it might do, which is renew a focus on this topic of efficiency. Something that you know non-researchers might uh, not know is that so far in AI research, efficiency, how much compute it takes, hasn't been as discussed. So usually when you read a paper, you have kind of a graph or a table showing the performance statistics and you say, oh, I was able to get this level of performance. Uh, but you don't usually necessarily include the amount of uh, computation it took to get to that level of performance unless your paper specifically deals with that. Um, and that actually has been kind of a flaw or maybe something to criticize in AI research where in some cases you get really good new results, but that comes at massive compute that only really large companies or labs are able to do. So this kind of uh, tracking seems to point to a future where maybe it becomes more of a standard to actually evaluate and include specifically how much compute it takes and how it compares to prior work in terms of compute for your uh, system. I think it's really important that OpenAI is making this push. I think in uh, research, people push on accuracy without thinking about efficiency, like you said. Uh, but in practice, in industry, uh, people care a lot about efficiency because that comes with increased costs, increased time for inference, all sorts of things. This is what matters a lot in practice. Uh, and I've seen uh, folks in industry, companies really, really care about it, um, but they don't know how to search for this in the research that has come out, which only shows uh, essentially this uh, leaderboard of accuracy uh, without any, any uh, sight of uh, efficiency. So as part of its benchmarking effort, OpenAI also said it'll start uh, with vision and translation efficiency benchmarks, specifically ImageNet and WMT14, which is uh, the machine translation uh, benchmark, and it will consider adding uh, more benchmarks over time. And I think this will be a really, really good push uh, on the academic front. I'm also uh, actually kind of impressed with OpenAI being able to be this bridge between industry and research and be able to push something like this out because I think perhaps they've been able to gain insight on the industry front to see that this is a need, but also are able to implement it in a way that researchers in academia and the like uh, would be would find it amenable. Yeah, I agree. I think this is interesting and it's the kind of thing that a traditional lab or researcher might have less incentive or less ability to do, just devoting time to compiling information and presenting this kind of report uh, that doesn't necessarily fit that cleanly into standard research practices. So usually you would have some sort of idea, you would write a paper about it, you would get some results and experiments. Here they're just collecting what is known and making kind of a case that we should care about efficiency. Um, so it, it does show that their kind of quasi-academic, quasi-industry status can be used for good, as is in this case. Uh, and it's also worth noting that this point of view, that people should care about efficiency, agrees with researchers at the Ellen Institute of AI, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, University of Washington, who also last year advocated for making efficiency a more common metric alongside accuracy, which is uh, more common still. And of course, this is uh, symbiotic with the work on green AI or making AI more efficient so that um, we can have uh, less impact on climate change. 
uh, at large. And so I think this is a great push and going in the right direction. Agreed. Uh, yeah. So let's uh, move on to our next article here called an AI can simulate an economy millions of times to create a fair tax policy, which is from technology review. And this is about a project called the AI economist, which was done by the company Salesforce. And basically it's about this project where they created a simulated tiny little city. You can think of like Sim City or something like that, where you had some notion of workers and they used AI techniques to try and develop a tax policy. And I say tax kind of, we should acknowledge that this is within this limited simulation, but they designed kind of a tax policy that was trying to maximize productivity. So how much work was done while also minimizing inequality. So the gap between the rich and the poor. And they showed that if you simulate a lot of kind of trials and a lot of different tax policies, you can actually get something pretty interesting. And that at least in a simulated world works better than some traditional tax models. Uh, yeah, using this technique. So kind of a cool result. Um, of course, pretty limited because it's not really simulating the full complexity of human societies, uh, but still interesting. Um, what do you make of it, Sharon? I think it's a cool direction, but of course, um, AI has been shown to work really well, or at least has been able to optimize uh, environments really well when there are clear, defined rewards, objectives, the whole environment is mapped and known. Uh, and uh, I, I think just in that limited kind of game setting, it works really well. So I'm not surprised that it works well here. Uh, but of course, it's understanding where this model breaks down, where the simulation doesn't quite fit the real world. Um, that I think is where this will break. Though something I do find really interesting is that they did test this on over a hundred uh, crowd workers through Amazon Mechanical Turk to see how it would influence human behavior. So that's a little bit of something in the wild. But of course, having done those experiments before, uh, often it is quite limited as well. Yeah, as you say, AI models, this is unknown. If you give it a closed world, a little game, you can develop some pretty impressive performance these days. So this article actually compares this to Alpha Zero, which is from DeepMind and learned to play Go at a superhuman level. And I guess an interesting comparison is that Alpha Zero is actually used now by professional players to try and gain insight into the game of Go and learn new things about it. So the hope here, I think, uh, is that economists can use this to sort of play test or verify ideas about different uh, tax policies, which is, of course, promising, but presumably also requires this idea to be developed a lot more. Uh, but as a direction, it still seems pretty cool. I think we can all agree that we're not happy with the current tax policy, perhaps. <laughs> no, I... I we can always do better, but I, I have a feeling we'll never be satisfied. I think we can always do better. <laughs> and I think that's what makes it challenging, actually, because uh, what is the reward function? What is the objective here? What, uh, who are we optimizing for? Who should be happiest, quote unquote, right? So, um, and what is fair? So I think, I think it could get tricky um, in terms of what kind of optimization is done. And now on to uh, a company that we talk about quite a bit, uh, Clearview in uh, surveillance. Uh, this is from The Verge. The article is titled Clearview AI to Stop Selling Controversial Facial Recognition App to Private Companies. So we've covered them before in past podcast episodes. Clearview AI has been one of the hottest topics in tech news recently, specifically around surveillance and the ethics of what they're doing. So their controversial face recognition app allows a user, such as a policeman typically, uh, to snap a picture of someone and immediately find a match in their Clearview AI database, which has mass scraped images from numerous sites, such as social media, so Facebook, Twitter, etc., to create profiles of people. In a BuzzFeed news article some time ago exposed that Clearview, 
who claimed their product was for law enforcement had many, many other customers as well, including uh, Bank of America, Macy's, and Walmart. And the list goes on thousands. And there are some individuals there too. Uh, the article quotes uh, says, Clearview AI says it will no longer sell its app to private companies and non-law enforcement entities. Um, and it will also be terminating all contracts, regardless of whether the contracts are for law enforcement purposes or not in the state of Illinois. Yeah, so pretty welcome development, I guess. Uh, and an interesting um, demonstration that having an active uh, set of journalists actually covering and scrutinizing these companies seems to have an effect where this seems to fall up quite quickly after our, we actually talked about this news article, I think a few podcasts ago, and now they're announcing this. Um, I guess one question is, is this going far enough? I mean, it's good that they are no longer selling to private companies, but uh, it still seems like a bit of a wild west and really strange that they were able to do so in the first place. Uh, this article notes that they are actually ending all contracts in the state of Illinois, and that's because there's actually a lawsuit uh, dealing with the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, which actually prevents uh, use of uh, facial recognition software. But it uh, doesn't apply to the rest of the U.S., so it seems that uh, Clearview still is hoping to operate elsewhere. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you think uh, Clearview should uh, limit itself further, Sharon, or we need more kind of scrutiny of it? I think based on the way it's been operating, I think it definitely requires greater uh, greater reins on this company. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, they are uh, prudent about not violating privacy. Yeah, it's also worth noting that some of this reporting came about due to leaks from Clearview. And I think if they leaked, uh, you know, their stash of photos, their stash of identities, that could uh, definitely lead to even you know worse actors, worse companies getting them. So it it seems very strange that we can have this company operating with seemingly little oversight right now still. And uh, I personally would like to see more of it soon. Bit of an add on to that. Uh, there's been an article called "AI in the Far Right: A History We Can't Ignore." And in summary, um, so we've seen a lot of concerning stories uh, recently about how some of these companies are using AI for surveillance, such as with Clearview uh, and Banjo. And while the operation of these companies is enough to raise eyebrows, we've also seen that they're connected with a number of actors with questionable purposes for using their technology as well, particularly tied to the far right organizations. Yeah, so some more specifics here. Uh, there was a report from One Zero that talked about how the founder and CEO of Banjo, Damien Patton, uh, was a former member of the Dixie Knights of the KKK. So he was actually a far right member as a, as a teenager and uh, actually did some crimes and, and shot at some uh, housing, I believe, uh, when he was younger. And also there was a report uh, about the founder of Clearview AI uh, showing that he had been affiliated with various far right uh, individuals. Uh, so Brad Braidbart writers, uh, Pizzagate conspiracy theorists, things like that. So this is a bit of a vague you know, connection where these individual CEOs have these connections. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a giant conspiracy or anything, but nevertheless, it does again, make it feel kind of weird that people with somewhat extreme views or connections are running these companies that are, you know, doing surveillance essentially. 
So as AI is being used by the far right, uh, AI is also being used by a fairly liberal country. So uh, the next article is from Slate titled, France is using AI to detect whether people are wearing masks. So we've already heard stories of how countries around the world are keeping track of their citizens in the midst of the pandemic. And among the programs of over 30 countries that have ramped up surveillance in response to the pandemic, China's, Singapore's, and Israel's have all con come under particular scrutiny for concerns over privacy violations. So even France, a country known to be very averse to surveillance, has integrated AI tools into its CCTV cameras in the Paris metro. So while France has shown itself willing to use surveillance to monitor citizens' behavior, their usage isn't as invasive as it sounds. So the article states the system created by French startup Dataka Lab identifies the number of riders who appear to have face masks uh, without collecting and storing data on individual passengers company says. And according to The Verge, the software works on locations wherever it's installed. So the data is never sent to the cloud or to Dakota's uh, lab uh, offices. This is also known as computing on the edge. Uh, so essentially every 15 minutes, it generates statistics that are then sent to the authorities who only have access to a dashboard that displays the proportion of riders with masks. So it doesn't uh, pinpoint individuals at all. And this is really France trying to differentiate themselves from these other countries that have come under particular scrutiny, but that they also want to be able to deploy some sort of surveillance to uh, try to encourage their citizens uh, to wear masks. Yeah. So this is kind of a different model of surveillance where it, it seems to be doing a lot to guard people's privacy while still allowing for monitoring and data collection that is presumably useful for knowing where to distribute masks, where masks are not being worn, stuff like that. Um, I'm curious, Sharon, if we had a system like this, let's say in the Bay Area in the US, uh, would you be comfortable with that kind of tracking mask wearing? I guess it depends what the actions taken would be. So they see these statistics, but what types of actions would this enable them to then perform? Yeah, it, it does. It, it would make sense to actually want to know why or, or what the motivation is to have this data. Uh, but uh, this article notes that uh, one place it's been installed since late April, the resort city of Cannes, uh, plans to give free masks to all residents. So the technology might help with distribution, assessing need, and understanding whether government's messaging around masks is effective or not. I think that's a valid thing, as long as it's not being used as a foot-in-the-door approach to mass surveillance um, on another level. Though the way that they've been doing it, which um, is trying to be very careful about privacy, I think is is valid. So the article does state, although it is now mandatory to wear a mask on public transport in France, and the country is considering fining individuals 135 euros, which is about $147 for going without them, the software was, will still not be used to identify, rebuke, or fine people. And I think this is important because uh, essentially what they're trying to do is identify hotspots of where people are probably groups of people are probably not wearing masks and then perhaps deploy, uh, some kind of law enforcement there. So not use the software directly, uh, which then falls under, you know, flaws in the software and potential mass surveillance, but maybe deploying law enforcement a bit more effectively. Um, and I think people are a little bit more, more okay with that. Yeah, I think there's, there's a few good things here. So for one, the implementation itself, as you said, is ad, Edge AI. So the computation is done on board, which means that it's kind of more limited, hopefully. Like you can't just change this to be a mass surveillance for facial recognition system. It's probably a little more limited and that's a good thing. Uh, and as you said, yeah, having a clear scope where this is not going to be used to find or identify people it's being used just to collect hotspots. If you use AI in that way, then surveillance might be sort of acceptable uh, if you are mindful about how you message and explain 
these things to us, the regular people. And I think that this could be potentially a really good model that other countries can then follow. Because before this, the models were a bit shocking or uncomfortable, I would say. And perhaps this is one that the U.S. or other countries might be more comfortable adopting, especially those with democracies. Yeah, and I guess it's uh, sort of makes sense because Europe often has led on privacy and AI regulation. We've heard of some of the uh, reports we've had on how to do it. Uh, so it's cool to actually hear that they are trying to do it and doing it in practice in a way that seems to be pretty well thought out, at least in this case. Okay, and with that, we'll finish up our 10th episode of Let's Talk AI. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. You can find the articles we discuss here today and subscribe to our weekly newsletter with similar ones at scanettoday.com. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to leave us a rating if you like the show. Be, Be sure, sure to tune in next week. week.